when Saturday would come around and I'd come by Charlotte for, to hang out with her, you know what we did on Saturdays? Door-to-door -door visitation. Never thought, never, she never complained, never, I never complained. I didn't, didn't care what we did as long as we were hanging out. But uh, that's the kind of upbringing she's had. Always putting the kingdom of God first. Praise God. I appreciate her. She's my wife, and I love her. Why don't you come up here? See, it's good for me to introduce her. I get to say these sentimental, husbandly things. Once again, thank you. That's precious. Maybe I need to speak more than once a month. I could you do with hearing that a little bit more often. Sorry about that. Tonight, I want to, I'm so glad each and every one of you are here. And um, I want to talk to you tonight on the subject of hearing voices. Now, most of the time we consider when someone's hearing voices that they're not quite there. At the same time, we listen to voices inside our head every single day. We, we are surrounded by pressure, so we have pressure on, on us in multiple ways. We have the peer pressure to conform to what the cool thing is to do, right? So even at work, even as an adult, you have the pressure of your peers. Sometimes we pretend that's only a youth thing. No, we always have the pressure of our peers, how they're doing in their job and how it's affecting the way our work looks. So we also have social pressures, the things we have to do not to look like a loser, right? Like giving your, the presentation in front of the class or giving your presentation on your job. You don't like it. You would like to get out of it. But in order to look, not look like a loser and look like somebody who's got their act together, you conform to this social pressure that we feel. Then we have the moral pressures. When people are acting up and acting out, we have the pressure that we put ourselves under as to try to be the bigger person, to try not to respond in the same way that someone may be responding to us. So that's another pressure that we put ourselves under. Like, I don't want to behave like they're behaving back to them. I want to do better than that. So we have that pressure, the moral pressure. Then we have the self-assigned pressures. And that's our own self-expectations. The things we need to accomplish by such and such a date. The things we need to have accomplished by this age. The place we need to be on our job by this time. So there's, those are our self-imposed pressures. So we're always under some form of pressure. And um, it makes us, uh, there's, with that, along with that comes fear. Because all these pressures are forcing us to do these things we don't want to have to do. When someone yells at us, we wish we could just open our mouth and, and tell them back the way they're telling us, Right? We want to tell the teacher, no, I'm not giving that presentation, but you can give me an A. Here's my paper. <laughs> All these pressures make us fearful. And the fear, um, I wanted to tell you something, because young people, you need to know this, and then the rest of us need to remember this for the rest of our life. And that is, the, there is an illusion that you're either brave or afraid. But the psychologist, Brene Brown, she said it so beautifully. I'm going to repeat the words she said. She said, 
the truth is we are usually brave and afraid in the exact same moment. So if you can remember that fear, the conquering of fear is to have it and not let it immobilize you. To feel fearful and afraid and say, I'm going to do it anyway. That's when bravery steps out. So then fear didn't win. And I just love that. I'm going to probably paint it somewhere in the house. I need to remember that. Because so often when we're fearful, we put ourselves in the mold of being a coward or reacting in a manner that is not brave. So, but because we're surrounded by all these pressures, we have this internal voice inside of our head talking to us. It talks to us all the time. It tells us stuff about ourselves. It comments on others. It comments on others' opinions of others. It comments on our, us, what we're doing. It just has a general opinion at all times. I think the mistake some people have is to think that voice in their head needs to be shared with everyone. Just remember, your opinion is yours. Keep it. Don't let it go. That's yours. Hold on to it. Keep it where it belongs. Other people aren't as interested in your opinion as you are. Because we all have our own opinion. If your opinion don't match ours, then you look ignorant to us. And we don't see your truth as being a truth because our truth is different than your truth. So our opinions are our own. Um, the voice inside of our head many times can be very kind of cruel. It can say things to us that are not very nice. It will say things to us that we would never say to another living human being, right? You would never talk to someone else the way this voice talks to you sometimes. And I remember as a young person sometimes mistaking that voice and thinking that voice was my conscience. And that was a huge error in thought because that voice was filled with condemnation and it constantly condemned me. Even when I was trying to do good, it would condemn me. It's not enough. You prayed five minutes. Not enough. You read a chapter. Not enough. So you have to be careful that that little voice that's in your head is not um, controlling your actions because it can become a very condemning, judgmental little person and when I was raised they called it you know the preacher in the pulpit but that voice didn't bode me well because it wasn't my true conscience it was actually the voice of condemnation it was a voice that spoke to me in um, unkind words and it said unkind things to me things that the voice of God would never have said to me the voice of God would have extended love. It wouldn't have embarrassed me further. It wouldn't have told me you looked like a fool. It wouldn't have told me when you witnessed, everybody think, thought what you said was stupid. So that little voice was n in no way kin to God. And I hope that something I say helps, um, especially my young people, but I know it needs to help all of us as well because that can be confusing when you're trying to find your way as to what is the voices we need to listen to. Um, most likely when we act out of character, most likely when we do crazy things that no one expected us to do. We usually do it because part of us understands that we're trying really, really hard. But that voice in our head that we listen to is saying to us that we're no one, that no one is noticing how hard we try. It's saying they're not caring how hard we try and are trying 
is not making a difference because it's never enough. So usually when, when that reaches a stronghold in our mind and we know how much we try and then we're angry because this little voice in our mind keeps saying it's not enough, it's not good enough, you're not, you're, you're not doing good, and you start getting mentally kind of ill in your mind. You're getting um, down. You're slowly going down um, this little decline until you reach this point where you get furious because you are really, really down and no one else is aware of it. And you've been trying hard to do everything good for a very long time. And since no one knows this voice is talking, they don't know what to say to heal you, so they don't react. And so you begin to believe the lie, this little lie the devil works up to say that everybody is saying what that voice has been saying. Now everybody's saying it, not just the voice that you heard. Now everybody thinks it. Okay, and so that, it's at those moments that we do crazy stuff and we excuse ourselves by saying, you know, I just have to be true to myself or I need to be me. But it's, it's also moments when we pretend like what we're doing doesn't have a huge f- impact upon people because it does. But in those moments, we're, we're raging against that consistent something that's just degrading us that we can't see the truth as the truth. So we need to know we, self-knowledge is essential As if this has happened to you before, and um, I dare say if we're going to be vulnerable in this room tonight, 90% of us would say, yes, I've been down that road in one way or another. So it's, it's really essential that we know our own selves and know how our mind reacts to stuff because we are our own little... You know, we have all of the things that we were raised around. And so we have our own reactions to situations that may be very different from the person sitting next to you. Guy Winch, who is a psychologist, he has a popular blog on psychology today. And he wrote a book called Emotional First Aid. He tells of a woman who's been, who was, had been through a terrible, terrible divorce. And it took her months and months of healing to just to get over dealing with everything that she was dealing with. And so um, finally, she felt like she was finally ready to go out and try to meet someone new. She had met someone online, and so they were going to meet at a restaurant and just see, you know, get to know each other a little bit better. So she bought herself a new dress and got all fixed up and... When she got to the restaurant, after about 10 minutes of meeting this person, the man stands up and he says, I'm not interested, and he walked out. The pain of rejection was so great that she just sat there for a few minutes and she couldn't even move. She finally got the strength to call a friend, but when she did, the friend said to her, well... Why wouldn't he have done that? You look like a blimp because you need to lose weight. And every time you open your mouth, you bore people because you don't have anything interesting to say. Why in the world would a handsome, successful man like that ever go out with a loser like you anyway? That's shocking, right? Like that friend would be cut off immediately. In French. It's about the only word I can say that I remember, but it comes useful when I need it to. How could a friend be so cruel like that? I mean, that's just cold as ice. But what if I told you that the person that said that was not her friend, but that is what she said to herself? 
Now we believe it. Now we understand it. Because that is something what we're, that we do. When we are rejected, think about this. We start thinking of all of our faults and all of our flaws, and we remind ourselves of all of our shortcomings. What kind of friend does that to someone? So the voice we talk to ourselves with, when you, pull, when you set it aside from you and you look at it, you go, how could you be so cruel? You're like a beast. But when it's talking, you believe every word it says. You just crumble under it like, oh, my God, it's true. I do look like a blimp. Oh, my God. I can't think of anything interesting to say. Oh, my God. And that's the way it goes. So, and this is the whole point. In any other sphere beside the mind, if we had a broken leg, would we try to break it more? If we had, uh, if something had burned us, would we try to burn ourselves even more? So why are we saying things to ourselves that hurt ourselves in our own mind more when we're in a sad or a hurtful moment? When we're rejected, why do we reject our own self? So you can see that the point is we take great care of our physical health. Boy, we see a mole that's a funny color. We're off. We're, we're waiting in that lobby. We'll sit there for three hours, right? We're going to get that off. But every time we recognize that something is going wrong in our thinking or in our mind, we tell ourselves, it's all in your head. Get over it. <laughs> That's like saying to someone that has a broken leg, it's nothing. Just walk on it. It's all in your leg. It's just in your leg. Go ahead and walk. It's fine. No, the mind is essential to good, well living. The way we think about stuff is essential to our own personal sense of satisfaction. It's absolutely essential that we understand our own proclivity in times of defeat, failure, rejection, so that we can stop it at the pass and say, no way does anybody talk to me like that if I am in control. So our mind makes all these little things. And, you know, loneliness is something. Loneliness, I don't know if you know this, but loneliness... It is an emotion that will literally kill you. Did you know that? Um, chronic loneliness increases your chances of an early death by 14%, causes high cholesterol, high blood pressure, suppresses the immune system, opening your chances for other illnesses. So chronic loneliness, they say, poses as significant risk as cigarette smoking. And yet, we are all lonely. Why? Most people feel lonely in this day and age, even when we have Facebook, which is a wonderful medium to communicate with each other. Um, loneliness is still the number one reason for depression in the West. Think about that. It was interesting to me that it was said of the Dalai Lama that he cried when he heard that Americans don't like themselves. We have so much, yet our consistent obsession with ourself is making us lonely and unhappy. You say consistent obsession, I don't think I'm great. You don't have to think you're great to be self-absorbed. Um, 
we all, you can be thinking thoughts of, I'm not, I'm not doing, I'm not doing what I should be doing. I haven't made the right choices this week. I'm not being the best mother that I could be. I can't be the best mother tomorrow either because I have all this list of things to do. Um, I'm, I can't meet my goals by the end of this month because I'm already behind. And I haven't been with friends in like a month and no one even cares. No one's even called me. And everybody else seems like they're going out having fun, but I'm not. I don't have any special person that I love at church like I wished I loved them. I don't have, so it doesn't have to be good self-absorption. It just needs to be self-absorption. What we need to do is instead of thinking of ourselves, this seems so simplistic that like you just want to throw it over in the trash and forget it, but what we need to know on a daily basis is that, the, is that we are actually one of seven billion humans on this earth. We are social creatures. We must consider, love, prefer each other for true friendship, happiness, and self-love. So when you walk out in your day, instead of thinking, I've got to rush to the grocery store, I've got to get groceries, I've got to get back, I've got to get over here, we begin noticing people around us. And the old person that drops the book, you pick it up for him. And the, the, the person, you hold the door open a little bit extra for someone. Or you smile at someone that looks like they're frustrated. But you start t- tuning in to the people that you're passing by in your world. And you start noticing them. You, start no- you just make a comment to the person at the cashier. You tell someone, isn't it a beautiful day? And pretty soon, this lack of self-absorption makes you begin to feel happy. Shock of all shocks, right? Um, So if the voice in your mind is telling you, I'm a loser, I'm sad, I have no friends, no one likes me, I wish I had a good family, that's still, you're listening to voices And that's still self-absorption. And may I say this, I'm just as guilty as everyone else. (laughs) We just get caught up in our own little thing. And we pass thousands of people. We don't have time to look at them because we get to run to the next thing, right? So no real sense of love. Self-centeredness is also... As much as it is that we go about our day, if we don't go about our day looking at our human next to us in line, if we don't notice where we are in the present moment and make some kind of little social connection, then no real sense of love begins to breed in us. And then at work and different places like that, that competition and jealousy begins to start because we're not connected to that person and we wonder why they got that raise and we don't understand why they're getting more billable hours than you if you're a lawyer but that's the way these things work it's because we're not really looking at that person with a sense of love like you're just like me And we're all trying to do good. And I appreciate everything you do. And seeing them as just another one of you. And then love begins to breed. And the competition and all the jealousy goes away. Because you realize we're all, what's like, if I like to think of it, I don't know, this was just my own personal mental picture, but when you see a pack of dogs to get together and they're all wagging tails and there's just a bunch of them, they're every size and every shape, they're so happy, they're just all there. And if you think of that, we, that's the way we should be. We're, we're social. We, want, we need to be reaching out. Even when we're rushed, just saying hi as you pass someone with a smile helps you. You benefit from it. So we have to know that, you know, everybody talks by cell phone. 
and the relationship evolves, but you become increasingly distant from people you lie to, and you become increasingly close to the people you tell the truth to. So if you're talking to a friend and you're saying, oh, I'm fine. My child graduated with A. Oh, my daughter's this. Everything's great. Oh, this. And you know how we all do. So we don't want to seem like we're down. But we're not passing a truth. And so that friend actually becomes to us less of a friend than the one we say, you know, I've been so down this week. I couldn't quite figure it out. But this happened and this happened and Maybe that was something. Just the kind of friend that you can start talking and then figure out your own problem. (sighs) That's the kind of friends we need. (laughs) Because as you talk, it's called the talking therapy. As we talk, we begin to solve our own problems. That's why women get so mad at men because men like to solve problems. And and it helps them, like, it helps them. They want to help you by solving your problem. And sometimes we want them to solve our problem. Like, there's a leak. It's leaking. It won't stop leaking. And they go, I'm going to take care of this. And you go, oh, I love them so much. So let's not forget about the times, lady, that we do want them to solve our problem. There's a spider. It's the size of a silver dollar. You know, we can't just be so quick to say we don't want you to solve our problem. There's some problems we do. The oil needs changing. They just get mistaken about which ones they can and which ones they can't. Because, you know, they can't really read our mind, right? So, men, we're sorry. Sometimes we jump down your throat, but we do appreciate the things that you do fix for us on a daily basis. Um, But then there's other times we just need to talk, and hopefully we get mature enough in our relationship that we can just say, no, don't fix this. Let me keep talking. No more interruptions. (laughs) So, and that that way you don't get mad. They don't know. They think they're still on the fix-it problems, you know. Be sweet to each other. So, um... Loneliness is not coming from our environment. That's what I want you to get from this tonight. It's not our environment that causes loneliness. It's the voices in our head that cause loneliness. It's an attitude of constant self-awareness. This is how I feel right now. I'm not feeling too good. I don't know what's wrong, but... And we'll figure it out in a little bit, a little bit. This constant self concept. Um, so if we take time to consider if others are happy, if we t- strive less for ourselves, the happier we'll be. If we consider others more than ourselves, that's how happiness is born. And so we need to love going We need love going out of us every day, and and it's essential to understand how we react to failure. Personally, okay, there was a story where three um, toddlers were given identical toys where they had to slide a red button to get the little toy to pop out. And the first child that tried it, um, he pushed the purple button, and when she couldn't get it to happen, she sat back and gave up. Now, these are little babies, so this is, not, it's not a, this is not something you could train. This is someone's personality type. Then the little boy that was right next to her, he saw what happened to her, and he busted out crying and didn't even try the toy. Then the next little girl next to them, she just continued messing with the toy until it popped up. up. So you got three natural reactions Two gave up when success was just a few more minutes away. 
So that's why each of us needs to know how our own brain reacts to failure. Sometimes a single failure will trigger something in us that makes us just give up without even trying. I did that in my French class the first semester. Somebody came in there and said, he's asking these questions. And I go, okay. I just got my answers to those questions. When I went out, he asked me other questions. And I just answered him in French those questions. He was going... I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't know French. <laughs> that was my very first test, my very first semester. And UNCG has this policy in there. They force you to take language, which you're never going to need, most likely, um, unless you're going into a field that demands it. But they start speaking French on the first day, so you do not hear one word of English on your very first day. <laughs> It was insane to me. Like, just tell me what the verb is and what I means, and then I can catch it. But you just start speaking. I know it's a, it's a tactic, but it didn't work on me. <laughs> and I finally got one real French teacher. She was from France, and she spoke English 70% of the time. I learned more from her than any other person. So anyway... Um, how many of you, I love what um, Guy Winch said when he said, our feelings are not something dependable and nurturing. They are like, very mo like a very moody friend who can be very supportive one minute and very unpleasant the next. So that's good to know. Like, some of us just go our whole way on our feelings, and now we need to know that sometimes they're combatant with what we are even trying to do. Like, they're standing in the way between us and success. So, um, and what, what how, how many know what rumination means? That is to continue to chew over, replay a scene that's happened in your head for days, weeks on end until it's a habit and then it's a costly habit because you put yourself at huge risk for chronic depression, alcoholism, eating disorders, heart disease. To get this, if you're already in something like this or you've been and you possibly will go again, which isn't likely, um, studies have shown that if you can in t take a two-minute break and get really involved in something for two minutes you and keep doing that every time that thought comes up, whether it's a crossword puzzle, whether it's something you enjoy doing, if you can stop thinking about that for two minutes and you keep doing this little warfare with your mind, you can conquer that. I thought that was something that's really, really nice to know because... Um, the whole point is you have to force yourself to stop thinking about it. And you can't if you're just sitting there staring at a movie or something. You have to do something that demands every ounce handball, right? Something where you can't think anymore um, about it until you begin to heal from that thought process. So, remember I talked about a schema being a mental structure that we put all of our thoughts about a subject on? So, if we have a, a hurtful story, say we have a time in our youth when we were embarrassed in high school, okay? We have that whole little story written out on like a page in our mind, and it's in this little frame thing called the schema. And that story stays just in that perfect form in your mind. And so when you bring that story out to talk about it again, the brain cannot separate whether that story is happening just this minute or if it happened 10 years ago. So you begin to feel the exact same emotions from that story that you felt way back when. And for that reason, although talking therapy does work, sometimes 
because we retell the story the same way, and it always ends the same. With that hurtful moment, we never, ever heal. And it's so important for those stories that we that always come, and every time they come, they just like stab us in the heart and then leave. And we're left to just deal with the hurt all over again. It's very important to take those stories and rewrite them to have a meaningful ending, to have a place where it comes to a different ending than the one it had before so that it can't stab you every time that it leaves. Because we have this thing in our mind that we either notice that the glass is half empty or half full, right? Everybody, they, they claim that, you know, we're one of two things. We notice the glass is half empty or half full. But if we ever in our brain recognize something as a loss to us, it's ten times harder for us to change it into a plus, so it takes a lot of work if something in your mind represents hurt, um, failure, rejection. It takes a lot of work to move it from that story into a story where you look back and you say, you know what? Seeing that now, I recognize the reason one thing that was a situation was my mother was working so hard. She was exhausted when she came home from work. She was dealing with this and dealing with that. And she, I do recognize now as an adult that she said the wrong thing, right? You've changed something already. You've changed something that could kind of upset that same old store that you were fixing to bring up when she called you lazy. You know? So you're going to go back and you read and you say, she, I can see I probably was laying on the couch and never want to do nothing. And it's made me mad all my life that she's called me lazy. Because I'm not lazy. So then you kind of go back and you think about what she was going through and, and how now, now that has changed you into a place that you are a very, um, you make sure that you get your work accomplished and you, you, you never just leave work undone. And, and now you just change the story and say, I, looking back, I see how that story helped me to become what I am today. Maybe you were horribly embarrassed by a teacher in high school. And you say there was no excuse for that whatsoever. That was the rudest, hateful thing I've ever heard. But instead of letting that story always hurt you, when you think about it, you turn it around and you say, now for the rest of my life, I will always want to make sure that I don't embarrass others. And I'm going to be kind to everybody because I don't want to be someone like that. So then that becomes your new ending. And if it's hard to remember the ending, write the new story down. And when you forgot it, rewrite the new story down. Until finally, when you think of that story, you only think of that new story, that new ending that cannot ever stab you again. It's a healing memory because now you're better. You've learned. You've matured. And now you're going to help others not who have gone through that. Now you're going to not try, you're going to be extra careful to notice something. If, you're, if your parent was an alcoholic and maybe as growing up, you, you quickly were able to assess by the look on their face, whether they were mad, angry, whatever was fixing to happen. Now when you look back at that story, you say, you know, that was really tough. But all my life I've been able to read hurt, pain, anger in other people. And I can try to help people because I read people's expressions so much easier because I, w I lived in this kind of a home. So when you take your story and you remake it, it becomes a place of healing and it no longer becomes a place of deep hurt. The things that we can do, I know when you get embarrassed, young people, you think that you know, you're embarrassed because you're embarrassed. You're embarrassed because your face is red or whatever. But when you do something um, 
embarrassing or if you do something that you're guilty or whatever and you involuntarily blush or you slump with shame, these are actually, and I want to tell you this so you'll just remember this, these are actually um, built-in displays that signal vulnerability to people. And they actually serve a very positive end because they endear you to others. Others recognize you're embarrassed, and they feel for you. So after a misstep, maybe you said something and it was embarrassing, you shouldn't have said it, or whatever. When the, when the, the, the shame and the embarrassment that comes over you comes on your face, it really is a nonverbal apology. And they see you, this is a fact, they see someone that is embarrassed by what they did, as a more ethical person, and they empathize with you, and they offer you greater help. So don't ever be embarrassed by being embarrassed, because it makes us all go, oh, let me help you help her. But if you remain emotional in those moments when you actually have stepped out of line, and you don't signal one way or another that you understand that you broke the norm, then you will not win the popularity contest. <laughs> because people will not, people will look at you and go, that was odd. They didn't even act like they noticed that they did something. So just think of that, you know, as you, don't try to hide your hands shaking when you talk. That causes worse anxiety. Believe me, I know. Um, don't try to stop your knees from shaking. If you're giving a presentation, let them shake. It just makes other people empathetic towards you. And it actually makes them like you better because they know that they're, how they're going to feel when they get up there. So just don't let yourself be ashamed by these things because public speaking is greatly feared, right? So as a closing thought, when all these voices in our head, how can we get to a place where we're, um, we can stop them? How can we just stop the whole process? Well, this answer is going to bore you with its simplicity. Nevertheless, it's the truth. Gratitude is what will stop all these voices of loneliness, of embarrassment, of hurt, of blame, of shame. Gratitude, whether it be during loneliness, embarrassment, or terror, rather than making everything a catastrophe, whether instead of catastrophizing it even more, just begin to be grateful for what didn't happen. Oh, I'm thankful. I did fall on the first step, but it could have been really worse. So the way you stop this, just this, this tirade when it's in your mind and you're going like this, is to become grateful for things. What does the Bible say about grateful? Um, it's King David wrote, it's good to say thank you to the Lord, to sing praises to the God who is above all gods. Every morning, tell him, thank you for your kindness. And every evening, rejoice in all of his faithfulness. So here he's telling us at least two times a day in the morning, you need to thank him for his kindness. In the evening, you need to rejoice. But when we're, gra when we're grateful for just ordinary moments in life, then we understand the true love of life because when people are dying, what they speak of missing is not when they skydived off of Everest, which I don't believe has been done yet. Nevertheless, proving my point, it's not that moment. When they are dying, they say what they miss is the ordinary moments, the family gathering for dinner, the week they took the time to write some, this week I even took some time to write some things that I was grateful for um, because 
just, I want to begin to practice this practice. It's not just about, you know, I'm going to be grateful. No. To be grateful, you have to actually sit down and think of things in your life, your personal things, that you're actually very grateful for. Paul tells us a sad story of someone who knew about God but refused to give thanks or worship him. And because of that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, and neither were they thankful. And because of this, they became vain in their imaginations, self-absorbed. Because they weren't grateful, they become absorbed in self. And then... The Bible says they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened and they became fools. So God tells us that we have to get our mind off of ourselves, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. We have to quit thinking about ourselves, our situation, our pain, our hurt, our suffering, our prizes, or the things we're glor- glorying in. We have to quit thinking about ourselves, and we need to go and help others, bring others into our life. And through this gratitude... You say, do I, do I really need to meditate? Um, yes. You don't want to do it, do you? You'd rather read that thing that says three tips on how to have peace tomorrow. You want to read that thing on three things, how to reduce stress and have a relaxation of your mind. You, go ahead and read it. You'll be bored, silly. You know everything it says. Go ahead and keep hitting those things. They bore you to tears. Those bloggers know how to get that five steps to thinness. You've heard, you've heard every one of them before. You just, like, wasted 30 more minutes of your life. So, yes, you have to meditate. The Bible said you had to meditate. He said so many times in the Bible, I'm not going to even think about reading. I'm going to read you two. He said, one, he said, be still and know that I am God. He said, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all you've done, and I consider the work of your hands. How do you do that? The Bible says in Psalms, David said, my heart became hot within me as I mused, as I just sit and meditated on God's greatness fire burned, and then I spoke with my tongue. Meditation is not something that the Buddhists get to do, and we don't. The Bible has multiple, multiple things that we have got to meditate, so take it out of your mind that the Buddhists thought it up. No, they did not. It's in the Word. Look it up. Meditation verses. You'll go. This is what I want you to think about. I'm going to leave you with this. The Bible says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow and they don't reap, but God takes care of them. So if you're sitting outside and you're just watching the birds of the air and you see what they do and you think about the God that made them and that how he takes care and he notices when they fall. He says, Consider the lilies. They don't work. They don't try to sew their clothing. But they're clothed richer than Solomon ever was. So when you're looking at the lilies and you go, that is so beautiful. God made that beauty. You're so great. How did you do that? Consider the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow to make a fire. If he watches over that, won't he take care of you? Won't he take care of your problems? Don't worry about your stock market value. For the Bible says the pagans do that. But just concentrate 
on meditate on the things of God and let his words come to you and let the things he does as you just watch a sunset in the evening and it paints itself pink and orange and yellow. No, you can't heal your mind by the uh, five successful tips for the successful human. But watch a sunset as it sets and think of the greatness of your God. And healing will come. And a fire will begin to burn within you. And you'll say, how great is my God. How great is my God. Let all the world say, how great, how great is our God. You may stand. You can't be healed in a minute what took years to do. But God, and you got to heal yourself, heal thyself, and then God will help you heal. You can't do it by just saying, change my thought right now. I'm thinking about this thought. I can't stop. No. Meditate on the things of God. You got to do the work. He will help you heal.